and welcome. Thank you for coming tonight. I know we're all very busy, so the fact that you're spending your evening with me warms my heart. So thank you for coming out. Um, so yeah, Kingsbane. Okay, so I, just to sort of gauge the room, who here has read Furyborn? Okay, great. Who here has read Kingsbane? The Lone Hand. <laughs> you, you know things. I know things. <laughs> um, so great, that's good to know. Uh, wait, so raise your hand if you have not read Furyborn. Great, so I'm trying, I'm going to keep this like very friendly to you, spoiler free, as spoiler free as possible. Um, so what I thought we would do, um, I'm just gonna, for those of you who don't know what the books are about, I assume that most of you do, but I'm going to describe the books and then I'm going to do a short reading, very short. I'm not gonna make you sit there forever and ever listening to me read because that gets old really quickly. Um, and then I'm just going to sort of word vomit at you for a bit about how much I love these books and how much they mean to me. And then we're going to do a Q&A and then a sign-in. Yeah. Okay. Um, so for those of you who do not know, um, this is book one and book two of the Imperium Trilogy, which is a young adult epic fantasy series that I often pitch as um, Avatar The Last Airbender meets His Dark Materials meets Game of Thrones. Mm but um, less problematic and treats its women better than any of those properties. <laughs> um, so um, it is the story of a centuries long war between humans and angels and the two young women who are fighting at the heart of this war separated by a thousand years. And um, each of them are trying to determine if they are in fact the subject of a prophecy that says two queens will rise, one of blood and one of light, one with the power to save the world, one with the power to destroy it, and their arrival will signify the return of the angels and their revenge against humanity. So no pressure, ladies. Um, it is it is the, the story of my heart. It is um, something I've been working on for a very, very long time, which I will tell you about momentarily. Um, but something that's really important to me about this trilogy, its thematic heart is really exploring the tragedy inherent in telling young women what kind of what kind of person they should be, how they should use their power, how, what they should desire and what they shouldn't desire. Um, you can see throughout the course of this trilogy, both of these young women being told by all the people around them, even some people who are very well intentioned and love them very much, what kind of person they should be. Um, each of these two girls is trying to decide, okay, so I have this power, I think I'm the subject of this prophecy, and it says there's gonna be a good queen and a bad queen, so which one am I? And what does good and bad even mean and who gets to decide that and um, has my fate already been decided for me because of this prophecy that happened centuries ago or do I still have the chance to determine the course of my own fate and so they are grappling with these very like easy super not stressful questions and they are in the midst of this huge conflict at the same time and um, they're trying to decide how to use their power and how to claim agency and write their own story in a world that would rather do it for them. Um, so what I thought I would do next, wait, raise your hand if you have not read Fury Porn. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, <laughs> so what I will do, I feel like I was going to read the prologue of book two but I think it might be spoilery for those who haven't read Furyborn. What do we think? Those of you who have read Furyborn, wait, it's just you. <laughs> it's just you, you've read Kingsbane. Do you, do you concur that you think it's too spoilery? A little bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like you also say, who cares and read it anyway? <laughs> Raise your hand if you want me to read it anyway. Okay. <laughs> That's enough hands. Um, so in... So I'm just going to read it, I think, without context. Should I read it with context? <laughs> so um, in, the, in the prologue of book one, we enter the story at a very dramatic moment. Um, lots of stuff happens in that first chapter. And then from there, we split off into two POVs, two narrators in two different times. And they're separated by a thousand years. So after this prologue, which is sort of the linchpin of the whole trilogy, narratively speaking, we then go into Riel, who is one of our two protagonists. We flash back two years earlier and see what led up to that momentous, very intense prologue. 
And then our second narrator is A Thousand Years in the Future, Eliana, and it alternates back and forth between their perspectives so that we learn, um, first of all, how we got to that point in the prologue, and then what the heck they're going to do after what happens in that prologue. Um, so in that prologue, there is a young boy named Simon, and we see everything that is happening through his eyes. And at the end of that prologue, how can I describe this without spoiling? At the end of that prologue, there is a huge magical thing that happens and he disappears. Okay? <laughs> so, um, and then the prologue of book two picks up right at the end of the prologue of book one through Simon's eyes. Okay. So it is called, the prologue of book two is called A Traveler and a Stranger. Yeah, yeah, this is fine. Okay. Wow, this is, yeah, it's going to be spoilery. It's okay. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> when Simon awoke, he was alone. He lay flat on his back on a scrubby plain, veined with brown rocks and white ribbons of ice. The sky above him was the color of slate, choked with sweeping clouds that reminded him of waves, and from them fell thin spirals of snow. For a few moments he lay there, hardly breathing, the snow collecting on his lashes. Then the memories of the last several hours returned to him. Queen Liel giving birth to her child, Simon's father, his mind no longer his own, throwing himself off her tower. Riel thrusting her infant daughter into Simon's arms, her face worn, her eyes wild and bright gold. You're strong, Simon. I know you can do this. Threads glowing at his fingertips, his threads, the first one he had ever summoned on his own without his father's guidance, and they were strong and solid. They would carry both him and the child in his arms to safety. But then, the queen, behind him in her room, fighting the angel named Corian, her voice distorted and godly, a brilliant light exploding outward from where she knelt on the floor, knocking Simon's threads askew and summoning forth new ones, dark and violent, overtaking the others. Threads of time, more volatile than threads of space, and more cunning. He tightened his arms around the screaming child, clutched the blanket her mother had wrapped around her, and then a rush of black sound, a roar of something vast and ancient approaching. Simon surged upright with a gasp, choking on tears, and looked down at his arms. They were empty. The only thing left of the princess was a torn piece of her blanket, slightly singed at the edges from the cold burn of time. All at once he understood what had happened. He understood the immensity of his failure. But perhaps there was still hope. He could use his power, travel back to that moment on the terrace with the baby in his arms. He could move faster, get them both away to safety before Queen Liel died. He pushed himself to his knees, raised his skinny arms into the frigid air. His right hand still held the child's blanket. He refused to let it go. It was possible to summon threads with the cloth in his fist, and if he released the blanket, something terrible would happen. The certainty of that tightened in his chest like a screw. He closed his eyes, his breath coming shaky and fast, and remembered the words from his books. The Imperium lies within every living thing, and every living thing is of the Imperium. Its power connects not only flesh to bone, root to earth, stars to sky, but also road to road, city to city, moment to moment. But no matter how many times he recited the familiar sentences, the threads did not come. His body remained dark and quiet. The mark magic with which he had been born, the power he had come to love and understand with his father's patient tutelage inside their little shop in Am de la Terre, was gone. He opened his eyes, staring at the stretch of barren rocky land before him, white peaks beyond, a black sky. The air held nothing of magic inside it. Pale it was and tasteless, flat where it had once thrummed with vitality. Something was wrong in this place. It felt unmade and clouded, scarred scraped raw. Once, his mark blood, part human, part angel, had allowed him to touch the Imperium. Now he could feel nothing of that ancient power, not even an echo of it remain, not a hint of sound or light to follow. It was as if the Imperium had never existed. He could not travel home. He could travel nowhere his own two feet could not take him. Alone, shivering on a vast plateau in a land he did not know, in a time that was not his own, Simon buried his face in the scrap of cloth and wept. He lay curled in the dirt for hours, and then days, snow drawing a thin carpet across his body. His mind was empty, hollowed out from his aching tears. Instinct told him he needed to find shelter. If he lay for much longer in the bitter cold, he would die. 
The dying seemed a pleasant enough thought. It would provide him an escape from the terrible tide of loneliness that had begun to sweep through him. He didn't know where he was or when he was. He could have been thrown back to a time when there were only angels living in Avatos and no humans. He could have been flung into the far future when there were no flesh and, flesh and blood creatures left alive, the world abandoned to its empty old age. Wherever he was, whenever he was, he didn't care to find out. He cared about nothing. He was nothing. And he was nowhere. He pressed the piece of blanket to his nose and mouth, breathing in the faint, clean scent of the child it had once held. He knew the scent would soon dissipate, but for now, it smelled of home. A voice woke him, faint but clear. Simon, you have to move. He cracked open his eyes, which was difficult, for they had nearly frozen shut. The world was thick and white. He lay half buried in a fresh drift of snow. He couldn't feel his fingers or toes. Get up. The voice was close to him and familiar enough to light a weak spark of curiosity in his dying mind. An age passed before he found the strength to raise his body from the ground. On your feet, said the voice. Simon squinted through the snow and saw a figure standing nearby, wrapped thick with furs. He tried to speak, but his voice had disappeared. Rise, the figure instructed. Stand up. Simon obeyed, though he didn't want to. He wanted to tuck himself back into his snow bed and let it gently shepherd him down the path toward his death. But he rose to his feet nevertheless, took two stumbling steps forward through snow that reached his knees. He nearly fell, but this person, whoever it was, caught him. Their gloved hands were strong. He peered into the folds of fur covering their face, but could see nothing that told him who they were. They wrapped an arm around Simon, bolstering him against their side, and turned into the wind. We have to walk now, they said, their voice muffled in the furs and the snow, but still somehow familiar, though Simon's mind couldn't place it. There's shelter. It's far, but you'll make it. I will. Simon agreed with their words. They slipped into his mind, firm but gentle, and gave him the strength to move his legs. A sharp gust of wind sliced across his face, stealing his breath. He turned into the furs of the person beside him, seeking warmth in their body. He wanted to live. Suddenly, passionately, he wanted to live. He craved warmth and food. He clutched the baby's blanket in his trembling, half-frozen fingers. Who are you? he asked, finally able to speak. The person's arm was a reassuring weight around his shoulders, their gait steady even in the snow. For a strange moment, so strange it left him feeling unbalanced and not quite within his own body, it seemed to Simon that perhaps this person was not even truly there. But they answered him nevertheless. You may call me the prophet, they said, and I need your help.